somebody who can um, tell us not just um, about uh, the impacts on communities, but about the 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 the, the, um, the kinds of entities pushing these kinds of dirty projects onto us, and uh, and seeing that our governments actually uh, you know um, bend their uh, backbones very very subtly subtly and subtly from some of us and not so subtly sometimes um, is the our next speaker he will um, actually tell us more about reliance and what it is uh, up to because remember this um, reliance is not the big brother but the small brother and uh, not many people are very interested in this entity but i think it will be very interesting for us to understand um, the younger brother and his um, companies better and what he is doing in bangladesh for that we have a very eminent political commentator a journalist author and documentary filmmaker from india his work spans print radio television um, and film of course uh, he is also guest faculty member at a number of top educational institutions like the Indian Institutes of Management, the University of Delhi, JNU, the Asian College of Journalism, and Jamia Millia Islamia. He's hosted the chat show India Talks on CNBC India, which ran over 1400 episodes. So really, he's a lumbe reska ghoda. He has written um, a number of articles and books on fossil fuel industries, media, media and democracy in India. He's taken on the Adanis. He had to um, uh, step away from the EPW that he, um, uh, you know, he, he steered at that time. Uh, that was written about quite a lot. But today, he's not going to talk about um, uh, pet peeve Adani. He's going to talk about Reliance and um, he's written about the Reliance group. Poranjoy Guha Thakurta, we are so pleased you could join us today. Um, and yes, the mic is yours. Poranjoy, have you unmuted yourself? No, you haven't. I'm asking you, Paranjoy, to start your video and uh, your mic. There you are. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, uh, for uh, inviting me to speak on this occasion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Janab Sajad Hassan Tuhin. Thank you, Janab Mehdi. So I thank all of you for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak. I see a number of friends here. Uh, and Tuhin, you'll be very happy to know that uh, I uh, live in the national capital region uh, of India. Uh, and I, I am number one in the race. I mean, we are way, way above, ahead of Dhaka as the pollution capital of the planet. You know, uh, you know it's just uh, that during the COVID uh, lockdown period, things have improved. Having said that, let me, I was lucky that a little before this conversation began, I was able to access some information about the Meghna Ghat project. So I can add to what has already been uh, said by Tuhin. Now, as you know, once it is established, the Meghna Ghat 750 megawatt gas-based independent, quote-unquote, independent power project would be the largest in Bangladesh. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about the companies behind it, but it would rep it was supposed to represent, but we are not slightly unsure as I will tell you why, it was supposed to represent the largest foreign direct investment from India to Bangladesh. And it was originally meant to reduce the debt burden of Reliance Power by about 116 million US dollars which works out to roughly 835 crore rupees. And this money was payable to the Export-Import Bank of the United States of America. Now, uh, if you look at the sequence of events, how did it all begin? In June of 2015, 
the Prime Minister of India and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, Narendra Modi and Sheikh Hasina, they met at Dhaka and a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, was signed. But it wasn't until more than three years later, on the 31st of August, that finally an agreement was signed between Reliance Power on one side, Japan's JIRA on the other side, and Bangladesh BPDB, which is uh, the Bangladesh Power Development Board. Now, the way it was working, <coughs> as Tuhin was already pointed out, this was supposed to be the first of a series of projects which would eventually lead to the establishment of 3,000 uh, 3, megawatts of gas based what they call combined cycle uh, power project in, in phases. Now, there were three separate agreements. And now it's very interesting to know what will happen to these agreements because the deal is no longer what it used to be. The first agreement was a, a power purchase agreement and a land lease agreement with the Bangladesh Power Development Board. The second part of the, the second agreement was a gas supply agreement with Titas Gas, which is a subsidiary of uh, Petro Bangla. And third, and this is the most important part of it, was what is called a, an implementation agreement, which was signed by, with the, rather, the Ministry of Power, Energy and Mineral Resources uh, in, in Dhaka. And it was supposed to be implemented in three years. Exactly three years was the implementation of that. And at that time, if you recall in September, uh, when it was signed on the last day of August uh, 2019, uh, soon thereafter, on the 3rd of September, both Mr. Anil Ambani, the chairman of Reliance Power, said that this is going to really boost the economic uh, growth uh, and, and industrial growth of Bangladesh, and it will enhance the enhance uh, uh, um, enhance the energy security of the uh, of the of the country and lead to clean, green, and renewable LNG or liquefied natural gas-based power. And at the same time, a similar sort of statement came from Satoshi Onoda, who was the president of JIRA. It has been pointed out by Tohin, what was being given to Bangladesh was really a relocation of a model which was all, all of a power equipment, which was already at Samalkot in Andhra Pradesh. Now, a little bit about JIRA before I talk about Reliance. JIRA is uh, was set up in October 2015. It is an alliance between two major Japanese power utilities. One is the Tokyo Electric Power Company and the other is the Chubu Electric Power Company. And together, this entity is one of the largest uh, power supply ent entities in Japan. And uh, the entire, and they, they deal with the entire energy supply chain from procurement of fuel, to the generation of power. And, and it has, uh, in Japan itself, it has invested in about 26 power projects, a total of about 67 gigawatt or uh, 67,000 megawatt. And, our, and, and in addition to that, there is an additional 10,000 megawatts or, or almost 10,000 megawatts or 10, 000, uh, 10 gigawatt of installed capacity outside Japan. And let me suggest something here. In a way, what has happened may actually be good for Bangladesh. Because Reliance has virtually withdrawn from the project. Officially, it will still have its shares, but the entire management and implementation has now gone to the Japanese. Why did this happen? Essentially because Mr. Anil Dhirubhai Ambani's group, of which Reliance Power is a part, has gone broke. It is bankrupt. Let me explain what happened. Once upon a time, the Reliance ADAG, and you must have uh, separated the two because the older brother uh, is Mukesh Ambani and the younger brother is Anil Ambani. Anil Ambani is 60 years old. Mukesh Ambani is two years older than him. Now, their father, uh, Dhirubhai Ambani, died in, on the 6th of July 2002. He died intestate. That means he died without a will. So then what happened was there was a big fight among the brothers and finally the mother had to mediate and intervene. And after this fight, which was out all over, it was out in the open and everybody was sort of saying terrible things about the other, the mother mediated and then 
they arrived at an understanding. The assets were divided. Mukesh Bhai uh, got uh, petrochemicals and petroleum and polyester, and Anil got power, financial services, telecoms. But now telecoms is part of the Anil group. Why did this happen? Because Anil Ambani's group slowly but surely started going down. It could not repay its loans. So from being a leading private sector generator of coal, uh, based on coal as well as uh, gas and renewables, it, it once upon a time, remember Anil, uh, the, the group, Reliance Power Group, <coughs> used to have an operating portfolio, which was almost like 6,000 megawatts, 6 gigawatts, like 5,945 to be precise. But now that number has shrunk. I don't know the exact number now, but it is really in a very, very bad shape. Why? Because it is not able to pay its debts. Now, let me give you two or three examples as to why it happened. Uh, firstly, Anil Ambani, 12 years ago, used to be like his brother, one of the richest men in India. In fact, he was the third most, his brother was number one, and he was in the number three position. And because, because after the division of the assets, his net worth in one year had tripled, had trebled. But then what happened is, you know, he had a series of high profile projects. Uh, one among them was with Stephen Spielberg and his movie making company, DreamWorks. Then he got into controversy after controversy, including the one uh, with the uh, French aircraft manufacturer Dassault to, to uh, make the, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, have a, a local manufacturing of the <coughs> Rafale aircraft, which has become a politically very controversial project. Now what has happened is, how do we know that Anil Ambani is bankrupt? I'll give you three examples and then conclude. In March 2019, the Supreme Court of India directed Anil Ambani to pay roughly 80, bill, 80, million, sorry, 80 million US dollars to the Swedish telecom equipment manufacturer Ericsson. And the Supreme Court of India told Mr. Ambani, Anil Ambani, that if you do not pay up, we will put you behind bars. At that point of time, his older brother's son was getting married. And if Bloomberg is to be believed, he literally had to beg the older brother to bail him out. The equivalent of about 600 crores. Once again, according to Bloomberg Quint, he uh, surrendered. 299 year old leases for two very, very um, big office buildings in downtown Mumbai uh, to pay this loan. So what happened after that, his troubles didn't get over. Uh, in March of this year, a London court, a judge, David Waxman, he told Anil Ambani's group, please play the equivalent of roughly 92.5 million US dollars to three Chinese banks. These were CDB, ICBC, CXM. In 2012, a company called Reliance Communications and another company, Reliance Infratel, they had uh, borrowed this money and they were unable to pay it back. And what did his lawyer tell the court? He says, our client's net worth is down to 9 million. Whereas his total liabilities are over 300 million. So effectively, he is bankrupt. So the judge says, but he has his private aircraft. He has his fancy yacht. His older brother helped him out. And uh, when Ericsson wanted the money, so why don't you go back to your older brother? So the lawyer said, no, no, it was a one-time uh, settlement. And, and we can't give this money kind of again. On the 22nd of May, the UK court ordered that he pay up this money within 21 days. Uh, and the whole issue was, whose guarantee is it? Is it a personal guarantee? Or is it the guarantee of the company which Mr. Ambani is being asked to pay? And he said, you immediately did deposit $100 million. I do, do not know whether he'll be able to do so. Uh, but Anil Ambani claims he signed within courts, and lawyers will understand what I'm talking about, a power of attorney limited to executing a non-binding letter of comfort to these banks. 
But the judge is saying, no, you are personally liable. It's a personal guarantee. Now, Mr. Anil Ambani's group has a similar problem. 1,200 crores is being now asked for by India's biggest bank, the State Bank of India. On the 18th of June, they asked for this money to be paid. And this matter has gone to the National Company Law Tribunal. And it may go up to the appellate tribunal. The same story, personal loan, personal guarantee, or corporate loan, corporate guarantee. So in Arindar, you way, have half a minute to wrap up. And I'm over. So in a sense, Bangladesh might be better off with the Japanese rather than Mr. Anil Ambani. Thank you very much.